G'day everyone, I'm Dr. Nick Coatesworth and this is the first episode of my podcast. One of the things that I realised during the pandemic and my position as Deputy Chief Medical Officer in Australia was that the complexity of the health system is poorly understood, that it's very hard to actually take the time, put the effort in to communicating to the public and my patients exactly what goes on lifting the hood on the health system, be that in their interactions with general practice, be that in people's interactions with seeking care in hospital, emergency departments, all the issues with waiting times. What we hear frequently is that our system is in crisis, that it's understaffed and under-resourced. But often we hear that in little snippets on the news or we read it in the newspaper We hear things from politicians, occasionally that's useful, but most of the time it just gives us a little bit of information and we're led to believe that our health system is in this chronic state of disrepair. And what I think that does actually is impact upon our confidence in the health system. I think we've actually got a pretty good health system in Australia. Oftentimes you'll hear people in the media say that conditions in our emergency departments are third world. Now, I've been in the third world, been in places like Sudan and and a place in Africa called called Chad, and and I can assure you that our health system is, is a lot better than that. But it doesn't mean that there isn't room for improvement. There definitely is. And I think what the COVID-19 pandemic has showed us in no uncertain terms is that whilst we might have a good health system, it's an incredibly fragile system. And it's one that we all need to have an understanding of in order to make that less fragile, to make the right decisions when we, for example, need to vote about policies. But I think most importantly, to understand how to navigate it as what we call a healthcare consumer. Now, you're not going to hear me use that word too much. A lot of people say healthcare consumer. I reckon consumers are people that buy the very large plasma TVs from Harvey Norman. I'm going to talk about patients uh, rather than consumers because they're the people that I treat. Patients actually comes from the Latin word patiens, which uh, which means means to suffer. And when we have interactions with the healthcare system, um, by and large, it's because we actually need help. And, uh, and oftentimes we're having the worst day of our life if we have to turn up to the emergency department with trauma or some other medical condition in, in need of assessment. So this is not all about health policy. This is also about navigating complex systems like hospitals. And hopefully what I'll be able to do is through some of the stories during my career, through interviewing patients that I've had, colleagues of mine, actually show you how to get a better outcome for yourself or your family when you're faced with difficult health conditions. So we're going to talk about this sort of stuff on this show. How do you navigate a hospital system? What do you expect when you're going to get discharged? What are some of the challenges in communication between healthcare professionals and the community? And what can we do better about it? And what I hope is that as we get better at this and do more episodes, we're actually going to have questions coming in real time, hopefully, that I can I can answer for you about the the challenges and how to overcome them. So that's where we're gonna we're gonna go with it. We're also gonna have some guests. We'll hopefully have guests from a whole range of of healthcare professions. Now I want to be very clear that I don't intend to necessarily get leaders of the health profession, you know, I'm presidents of the Australian Medical Association or heads of hospitals or that sort of thing. If I interview people, I want them to be right in the trenches from the front line, either in the trench because they're a patient or they've had a particular experience with the healthcare system, or they're in the trenches because they're a general practitioner out in rural or regional Australia, Uh, they're your local pharmacist, they're an allied health professional like a speech therapist or a physiotherapist. That's the sort of person you're going to hear from on this show because I think that they can make all of your experience is real and that you're more likely to learn from them. Of course, the leaders of the health profession, they they serve a role. I've been a leader of the health profession uh, myself, but you need to get the honest truth 
when you're unwell and you need to get the honest truth when you're trying to understand the healthcare system. And perhaps you don't always get that when there's a little bit of a lens or a little bit of spin on, uh, on those sort of issues. So let's get into it. Friends, the first thing we're going to talk about today, it's been fairly topical in the news of late, is pharmacists prescribing medications. Now, this is an interesting one because it's become a hot button issue for my colleagues in the medical profession who have registered some really deep concerns about another sort of health professional being able to prescribe medications. And to show you the difference between uh, what a pharmacist does and what a doctor does, the pharmacist usually dispenses. So most of us have turned up to the pharmacist with a prescription. The pharmacist has checked it, usually checked it against the other medications that we're on to make sure there's no interactions. They'll nearly always ask if you had this before and they'll give you a little bit of spiel about how to take it. Now that's the traditional pharmacist role with the doctor doing the diagnosis and the prescribing of the medication and the pharmacist doing the dispensing of the medication. Now, in other nations, and this is really interesting, I hadn't appreciated this until recently, in other comparable nations with similarly developed healthcare systems, pharmacists can actually prescribe medications for a range of what we would, in fairness, call simple conditions. And we'll go through in a minute what they are. Now, this sort of prescribing can take two forms. Either the pharmacist can be linked with a primary care physician, a general practitioner. Now, just on this, you're going to hear me not always use the word general practitioner because GPs are often sort of denigrated as just GPs. And I don't take that view at all. I, I think that GPs are actually specialists in what we call primary care. So you might hear me say specialist in primary care. And if I do that, I'm talking about GPs. And so uh, the GPs have uh, registered a, a, a pretty significant amount of concern uh, about pharmacists prescribing. So in some nations, the, the pharmacist works alongside the GP. Pharmacists can prescribe, but the general practitioner sort of oversees, I guess, supervises that relationship. So that's one way you could do it. Then there's this other concept called autonomous prescribing. And autonomous means they're doing it without any assistance. And this is the rub. Because whilst pharmacists have a very lengthy training behind them and are professionals in their own right, what they haven't necessarily been trained to do is diagnose a condition and then treat it. Now, I'll go through that again just to say that there are other nations with comparable health systems where pharmacists are prescribing medications. And we're one of the last in the OECD, the developed world, uh, to adopt that sort of model. And one of the reasons why we're the last is because the medical profession has tended to hold on to that. And there's two sides to this story. But to better understand it, we actually have to know what the pharmacist is doing and where it's been trialled in Australia. You might not be aware, but this has been trialled in far north Queensland and a number of pharmacists up there, most of whom remember in far north Queensland, they are living in remote and regional Australia where there are access problems to healthcare and where in some cases it's very, very challenging to actually see a general practitioner. And what they did was that they picked a single condition and that condition was urinary tract infection. So uh, a fairly simple condition to diagnose, but one that can sort of present, I guess, in unusual ways with unusual symptoms. And sometimes you can have simple symptoms of a urinary tract infection, but actually have a very complex infection that is life-threatening. That's in a minority of cases. It's important background information to know. So they pick this single condition and they say, okay, for young women, and these were women between 25 and 35, who, who come to the pharmacist describing the following symptoms, either pain on urination or urinating more often than they would otherwise do or uh, discomfort in the bladder region. For those women, the pharmacist would be able to prescribe one of three different antibiotics, 
and that this was highly protocolized. And what that means is the pharmacist basically got a flow chart that they've got to follow. And if there's anything outside that flow chart, they need to forget about it and refer to a GP, which would be the usual process. Six and a half thousand young women were able to benefit from this trial. They participated in it. Now, the majority of those got a single antibiotic called trimethoprim, which is a very safe antibiotic. You take it for about three days. One of the problems with the research, which was done by Queensland University of Technology, was that they only managed to follow up out of those 6,500, they only managed to follow up 2,500. So it, it, they, they didn't sort of capture everyone who had had these medications prescribed. But of those that they were able to capture... A whopping nine out of 10 showed that their symptoms had disappeared. So they'd been cured effectively. And the n number of complications that required either hospital admission or anything serious happening was very, very low. So I guess in simple terms, in the terms that I would understand it, the trial worked. And not only that, but thousands of young women were empowered to take control of their own health by choosing whether they were going to go to a pharmacist or a general practitioner. Now, I would say that this is a safe trial. Unfortunately, other doctors, and particularly doctors' leaders groups, like the Australian Medical Association and the College of General Practitioners, who's responsible for training our primary care specialists, they took a different view. They've had significant concerns that the problem is that the pharmacists, whilst they can follow the protocol, are unable to have actually pick the ladies who would be uh, likely to go on to develop other illnesses, like get worse, or may not actually have a urinary tract infection, may have another pathology. And that's called the diagnostic process. And that's why we go to medical school for four to six years and then train for 10 years after that to become, to become specialists. Now, the argument is the pharmacists don't have that, and therefore, if you can't diagnose, then you can't prescribe. It sounds like a fair enough argument. But let's put it, to wrap it all into one, into other terms. If you're a patient in far north Queensland and you can't get to see a general practitioner because of your urinary tract infection, then a couple of things are likely to happen. In that situation, your bladder infection, it might resolve on its own, might actually get worse and become a kidney infection, which is dangerous. Or you might just say, you know, I, I need this to be treated and you turn up to the emergency department. The, the latter two there are not desirable outcomes for the health system, particularly if you could have gone to the pharmacist. So in my view, I think this is worth trialling. I think this is worth actually doing the research on to make sure it's a safe thing, because I agree with the College of General Practitioners, safety is paramount. But I think where we're heading, folks, is towards a situation where, for those Australians that have trouble accessing healthcare, particularly those in rural and regional Australia, pharmacists can and should be able to prescribe a limited range of medications. Now, this is going to expand, obviously, beyond urinary tract infection. I'm, you know, my gut feeling as a doctor is not to be particularly comfortable with this. I'm a respiratory and infectious disease physician. One of the conditions the pharmacists will be able to diagnose and treat is asthma. I know that asthma can be a very difficult condition to treat. But at the end of the day, what I'm open to is a system where pharmacists and primary care specialists, our general practitioners, are actually working together to make sure that the patient has access to care. It's not about a turf war between two, prof two professions, two professional groups. It's about the fact that there's people in Australia who can't get access to care that they need on the day that they need it. And if we can change that, if we can change that by working together, we're going to have a stronger health system. You're going to hear more about this because it's going to be a big issue from the doctors' groups are going to, going to resist it. And what I might do is have some general practitioners on the show. I want their perspective. I want to hear it from pharmacists. And then we might even get some people from rural and regional Australia who've experienced being part of the trial and tell us about their experience with pharmacists prescribing medications. Watch this space. 
Now we're going to move on to the second part of the show, which is an interview with a dear friend of mine, uh, Heidi Prouse. Heidi, the wife of the late Andy Prouse, who was a patient of mine, a lung transplant recipient because of the condition cystic fibrosis, which, as you'll hear uh, from Heidi, is a condition that affects the lungs. And although it's a little bit different now because of new treatments in Andy's day, uh, he required a lung transplant. He lost his life for complications of that transplant a year ago. And what we're going to hear from Heidi is their experience and some lessons on how doctors like myself can improve the journey of people with chronic disease, improve their journey through the health system. Heidi, welcome. I'm so happy to have you as the first guest on this show. I feel very privileged. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Heidi, you're the wife of a late patient of mine, Andy Prouse. What I'd like you to do is, is tell us a bit about you and Andy and your story with the, the health system, how he came to have his, his lung transplant, and we'll go through some of the highs and the lows of that interaction, if that's okay. And, and I, I should acknowledge uh, to our audience that Andy passed away last year, 12 months ago, uh, from complications of his lung transplant. He was a patient of mine and, uh, and my wife's as a lung transplant physician. And, and it's unusual, but over that time, Andy and I became friends and you and I became friends and here we are. Yes, certainly with a lot of exposure to the healthcare system. Yep. Um, it's really nice to chat to you outside of the hospital. <laughs> is it? First time properly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Andy and I met about 10 years ago. Mm. Uh, as my mum would say, I went all the way to Canberra to meet a Tamworth boy. So we went to the same high school and uh, met him at a social gathering. And after a few weeks that we had been dating, he sat me down on the couch and he said, I need to tell you something. And I said, okay. And he said, I'm living with cystic fibrosis. And I went, actually, I knew. Okay. Uh, my mum had told me we had, you know, it was a small country town. Uh, but I was waiting for him to feel comfortable to share that with me. So by that point, I said, well, I'm already, uh, the first moment I saw him, I knew I was going to marry him. And I have told my mum that as well. A uh, bit of stalkery, really thinking about it now, <laughs> but I was I was already in a hundred percent, and so you know those first conversations was I'm not going to live a long life. Mm. Um, that idea that I'd had of growing old together was uh, not likely. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, he was very healthy. Yes, um, it was a you know, 25 year old strapping young man and doing all the things, working full time. Um, so we just lent into it. Yeah. And what did you know about cystic fibrosis at the time? What did you know about it as a, as a condition? Yeah, embarrassingly, all I knew was the country and Western song by the Wolverines. Right. 65 okay. Roses. So all yeah. I knew was that you pronounce it incorrectly. I knew nothing else. Mm. Um, I did recognise that it was something that did have a, li a short life expectancy, yep. but I really didn't have much knowledge. And, you know, for those sort of probably only first 18 months that we were together, he was incredibly healthy. And yep. all I saw of cystic fibrosis was the daily treatment regime. So a very healthy person is still doing about two hours of therapy and medication wow. and yeah. and care for themselves every single day. Yes. So fitting that in around, you know, a new relationship was, you know, just navigating that between the two of us. Mm. Uh, and then there was a circumstance where we had to move in together. And I said, well, we need to move in together. And Andy thought, no, you know. Why is that? It's, it's, this relationship is going so well. If I really let you into my world, you're going to see all of these things that yeah. I'm terrified about. Yeah. And uh, I said, well, you've got to do it. <laughs> um, I mean, that's an extraordinary thing, isn't it? It's yeah. For someone to, to have this, so young, to have this routine with living with a chronic disease that the person that they love, they've got to sort of think about whether they're actually going to let them in or not yeah. to that. And the fear of uh, the assumptions that I would make around, mm -hmm. you know, and the, and the fear, I guess, that he had around previous 
you know, any types of relationships with, um, you know, males, females and friends and, and mm. things. It's, you're really letting someone into your mm. life. Um, so, I mean, the thing was is we moved in together and it was so easy. Yeah, right. Nothing's ever been so easy. And and so give us an impression of, of what the disease was actually doing to Andy, what he had to do to sort of stave it off. Yeah, so cystic fibrosis is something that impacts the endocrine system and it causes mucus to build up in every single part of the body. So essentially that mucus, like if any of us get a little bit of a cold or a bit of a sniffle, it can turn into an infection. So if you think about that concept with cystic fibrosis, it's in overdrive. So essentially your role in order to prevent um, those infections is to expel and remove as much of that mucus on a daily basis. So the things that I learned in those first stages was there's no Sunday. You know, you yeah, don't right. get to have a day off. Every single day you have Every to do sing- it. No matter how you feel, what mm. you think about it, whether you want to or you're not, mm. it doesn't matter because you'll pay for it within 24 hours. So... Uh, nebulized antibiotics, which help to shift the mucus that's built up in the lungs. Yes. So that's one of the most, because it's open air, so most likely to get infections. I remember that was something that really, of all the things that he had to do over so many years, that was one of the ones that Andy found most difficult, those nebulized antibiotics. Yeah. And yeah. I mean, you know, I guess it was also looking at things like it takes so much time. Mm. Um, And you can have a device uh, that takes 10 minutes and after you've used that device for six months, it stretches out to 20. So you're only talking about 10 minutes a day, but then that's 10 minutes in the morning and 10 minutes at night. And once we think about the world and and how we utilise time and how do we um, cope with such a busy life, you have to fit these things in and you can't just have an afternoon off or a day off or you've constantly got to find the time to do it. So I used to joke that, you know, it took Andy two hours to get ready to go out, took me 15 minutes, but that's because he had to factor in Mm. all of that therapy and treatment so that he would be well enough um, to actually go out just for dinner. how, How much understanding do you reckon that the medical profession had when we recommend those things? I mean, you know, Doctors like me, we recommend sputum clearance all the time. We just say, oh, you know, do your sputum clearance. Do do you think anybody really grasps how much of an effort that is for patients with a chronic condition like CF? No, I know that I saw a very clever um, clip that one of the CF um, specialist teams did and they had to do the treatment plan of one of their patients for a day. And it was just seeing the day in the life. And, you know, particularly for adults, Um, You know, kids have great support by their family and their parents and they've got shorter days so Mm. they can fit things in in a little bit of a different way. But what if you're working full time and you have kids and, you know, you still have to fit all those things in? The part that's so challenging about it is you want to hear the best treatment plan Mm. that is preventative for you. Yes. You want to know how to access the best medical equipment that is going to make it as fast as possible But then you as the individual patient get to determine, are you willing to give the time and are you willing to invest in any cost that is associated Mm. with that? So I've always felt that the conversation is, I want you to tell me best treatment plan, but you can't get cranky at me if I don't do it. Can you talk us up to the moment, the years before transplant and the decision to accept the transplant and and how, how was that personally for you, you both leading up to the actual lung transplant? Yeah, well, I guess uh, to really show how I approached, um, I'd always worked in the community sector and a role actually came up with the local Cystic Fibrosis Association. So I threw myself in and I thought this would be a great way for me to learn about cystic fibrosis and not just have to pound Andy with lots of questions about, you know, what it is and, and what it means. And what I actually found was he would be faced with something that he didn't even know was coming. And the big challenge with cystic fibrosis is uh, similar to a COVID environment. Mm. Uh, People with cystic fibrosis can't interact with each other, so they can't sit and have a conversation. It's pretty hard to have a support group where you can't be across from each other, isn't it? So you're never hearing what other people are going through. Mm. Um, The only information that you have is what you Google, and that's never helpful. 
Um, the other part is the only information that you get is from your medical team. So I remember uh, Andy actually had a bowel obstruction the very first time mm. and we sat on it for, you know, probably 18 hours before we called the ambulance and, mm. and went because we didn't know what was going on. Yeah. And I remember very vividly one of the medical team saying, this is actually really common for um, someone with CF after 25. And we thought... How, how did how you is, get to 25 and nobody tells you yeah, that? Yeah, or no one said, okay, now you're 25, these are the things to start the, looking out yeah. for, particularly because he had a, a history mm. um, that would have made him more prone to that type of condition. Yeah. I felt that, you know, almost information was withheld because it didn't. they didn't want to create fear, but at the same time it meant that in a lot of circumstances we weren't ready. Yeah. Um, so it's how do you have work out what does get shared and what doesn't get shared mm. and who can inform you of the things to start looking out for. And so was, was transplant put on that agenda early or did that sort of creep up as well and just, just be discussed at sort of the last, not the last minute, but later in the stage of Andy's illness? So I think the from a child, mm. you as a person with cystic fibrosis know that eventually you are likely to have a, a transplant. Mm. Um, so it's not necessarily about these are the particular steps that you will follow, but what you do know is when you get to the point where your life expectancy is around about uh, two years, then the conversation around transplant may begin. Mm. So that's, you, you will know that from a pretty young age. You'll yep. be pretty much aware that that's the circumstance. It's almost like the rite of passage, um, the regular trip that people make. What we had was Andy called me one day and he was coughing up blood. And really weirdly, I just signed off a cystic fibrosis brochure for schools okay. that had talked about what to do if a child in a school started coughing mm. up blood. And so I said, is it more than a spoonful? And <laughs> You're asking all the, all the right all the questions. Right questions it's I'd a luckily, horrible thing though. No, I mean, and some, traumatic. Yeah. You know, imagine you're sitting in your workplace yeah. in an open plan office and, and this thing starts happening and it's really scary. Yes. Uh, and the worst thing that you can do when that happens is be scared because it yep. just keeps happening. Yep. So uh, another thing that we didn't realise was that if you call an ambulance, you could be taken to a particular hospital, which was where his care was. So I didn't call an ambulance. I went and picked him up, Okay. Uh, which I wouldn't advise. But sort of now our awareness of saying, you know, if we're on the complete other side of town to the hospital that we need to go to, that we could have that conversation with an ambulance to say, we actually really need to go to this hospital. Which, which you can do in Canberra because yes, there's only a couple, Canberra. but yeah. some of the bigger cities. Yeah. And you're not going to get driven tough. all across. No, no, yeah. I'm driving you across the Melbourne. The luckiness of our um, Canberra space. Yeah. So, you know, I picked him up, we took him to uh, the hospital and within 24 hours he was evac'd um, to, on a helicopter to... RPA, mm. uh, which at the time was where the base of his treatment was um, coming from. And it was obviously so confronting. Um, nothing had ever happened before mm. this point. It was so challenging for me at that time to understand what I could do. I had some really stern medical teams sort of just say, you're not coming with him. And so I'm sort of watching so you, the helicopter you, you, you go. Can't, no, I guess I guess not. You yeah. can't limited space and all that kind of stuff. But that's a that's a hard thing. Yeah. If you've got a your loved ones in a helicopter, they're not in a helicopter because things are going well. No. And then you've got to make the trip three yeah. hours up to Sydney and work out how to do that. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, I think communication is always a big point. Is this is what's happening? Yes. You're, you won't go on the helicopter. We understand that. Did you get do that? Do you have, no. Okay. Do you have a way to get to Sydney? Mm. You know, what support do you need? It was, you just need to know that you're not coming and off you go and we're going to run off now. And you're sort of standing there with all of the stuff and trying to go, mm. what What does this mean? So this is, this is a common thing that patients and their families, I think, go through, particularly when there's an emergency on. And it, it would have happened to Andy a couple of times, the concept of a medical emergency team being called in hospital. Yeah. And, and when I've been part of those situations, what you inevitably see, if you look, and often you don't look, but if you do, you'll see one or two family members just standing off to the side, just quietly observing and no one actually telling them what's going on, which is petrifying when you've got 10 people around your 
around your loved one. Yeah. And, and I presume that happened a couple of times in, in Andy's life. Yeah, definitely. Mm. And you, yeah, you're not a medical professional. So the words that are getting thrown around, mm. they do joke that I've got, you know, an associate medical degree in navigating the system. Yeah. So, you know, and certainly the last few years of Andy's life, those conversations made more sense to me. Yes. But certainly in those very initial stages, you know, I felt um, they kept saying Andy's had homoptosis and I was like, I don't know how yeah. terrible this thing yeah. is. What, on, what even is homoptosis? Mm. So I was having language that was medical used to me when they could have just said, as you know, Andy was coughing up blood. And I was like, can I, I don't even have the chance to ask you, what mm. does homoptosis even mean? Is it cancer? You know, I'm going to think it's the worst possible thing if you give me big words. Mm, mm. So you jump into immediate worry brain and you immediately go into worst case scenario. And how often did you and Andy experience that, that, that particular issue of using medical jargon, put a percentage on it, nine times out of 10, five times out of 10? All definitely, the time. definitely nine times out of ten. Yeah. I guess we got better with the jargon because mm. we started to learn. Yeah. Um, we also had some great medical professionals who we felt more comfortable going. Sorry, what was that? What does that word even mean? I can ne- can I you never spell have said it? <laughs> <laughs> can you spell it out for yeah, me? Yeah. Particularly um, infections that um, Andy had. You know, one was called stenotrophomosis, yeah. and I called it the dinosaur bug because I just the thought, stegosaurus. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like a dinosaur, probably walks like one too. So, you know, trying to kind of interpret this mm. information while you're worried yeah. is very alarming because you you can't actually understand how big of a problem you're in. So managing those expectations is important. Yeah. So when I, when I met Andy, it was around about 2016, he was in the lead up to his lung transplant, we were in that difficult phase of trying to get rid of one of those infections that in most times means that you can't actually have your transplant. Yeah. We we get over that, he has the transplant, and the next time I see him, he's gone from being someone who was near death to one of the fittest young men that I have seen. I mean, he was ripped, he yeah. re- really. <laughs> and and also, you know, we can't underestimate the one of the medications he was on that changed the pigmentation of his skin. So not only was he ripped, he had this beautiful, beautiful tan. tan that just I'm made him I'm surprised like Donald Trump goodness. hasn't got onto this I medication. It, clofazamine. Yes. And that's not to say anybody watching this should just Don't get onto it. the clofazamine <laughs> for a specific medication. And you could be orange, so, <laughs> you, you know. Um, but I think that was the thing is... Andy had completely physically changed. You know, his hair went dark again. Mm. He was grey before yeah. he had his transplant. His That's hair went dark. That's interesting, isn't it? I didn't even know that could happen. Yeah. You know, and it does happen, um, you know, after chemotherapy and mm. your hair changes and things like that. But it was incredible just everything that had, you know, it's almost like the oxygen had to go to the most important place and it was not reaching the extremities. Yeah. And then he has this lung transplant and it was so perfectly matched for him. Yeah. And it just completely revitalised his entire body. And how did you and he feel in those months post-transplant? Invincible. Mm-hmm. Uh, so relieved because I think both of us had not expected the outcome that we had and we were preparing for that. Mm. It was probably 18 months of living what we would have perceived as a normal life. Yeah. You know, he still had some medication, but he didn't have to do those nebulizers anymore, mm. the things that took so much time. It was just lots of tablets. So he could rattle, but, you know, the time that he had to spend on himself every day was a lot less. So I remember coming home and saying, I've got this thing on tonight. Do you want to come? And we're in the car and yes. off we went. And I went, oh, is this how people live? Yeah. It was, it was magical. Wild. Magical. Magical. So we got this amazing situation where... Andy's received a, a new set of lungs and, and as you say, it's this magical 18 months that y- you really hadn't anticipated before. He was, he was so sick with those number of infections that we had to get him over together, all of us, and, 
and not forgetting the impact that that had on him personally, trying to fight that required a whole heap of will mm. uh, for him to fight those infections and then go through the process of having his lungs removed and a new, new set put in. What were some of the highs and the lows of the interaction with the medical profession during that time, Heidi? I'd say one of the things that was both a high and a low that is helpful to understand and unpack is what we perceive as resilience from someone who has a chronic life mm. condition. Because in some circumstances, we perceive that resilience as blind. Uh, you've lived with this condition your whole life, so mm. you don't have any other choice. You yes. just have to deal with it. Yep. But not recognising that it still really hurts to live through and to constantly get up and mm. go again. Mm. So it, it was not very present in the early stage of his care where we saw conversations about burden of treatment yep. and mental health mm. coming into play and being considered and seeing when decisions had to be made around his physical health over his mental health mm. and how that's navigated. Yep. So it was circumstances where we had really positive experiences mm. and, and with you in particular is mm. actually having a conversation with him about how he was coping yes. and ensuring that that's in considered in ev all the treatment and care that's provided. So it's that, what I'm hearing from you is that there's almost a default assumption from care providers that people who have lived with these conditions are going to cope or they yeah. just have to cope somehow. Yeah. And, and that that kind of infiltrates the, the way we interact with, with people. Yeah. So what's a, better way of, what's a better way of doing it? What would you ask of the care providers that might be watching this show or, the, or what would you tell a patient and their family on what to demand? Because I think we should demand it. I think making the conversation about the emotional load mm. of any physical illness an open conversation that can happen at any time yeah. and be proactive in having that conversation. You know, I know that Andy had struggled in certain circumstances and I really encouraged him to raise it with one of his health professionals and that health professional was really uncomfortable about having the conversation and diverted to talking about football. Okay. And that was really tough because it had taken him so much courage yes. to have that conversation. Are you comfortable sharing what that was? Uh, it was just that it was the first time that he was really recognising his mortality. He yeah. was experiencing a lot of fear around death and he wasn't very old. He was, mm. you know, 26 at the time, so it was a long time before he mm. passed away. And we could see that not only was he struggling to maintain his treatment, but he was slowing down his participation in life. Yeah, okay. And we asked At for, such a young age as well. Yeah. And we, you know, we asked to speak to a social worker or get a referral for a psychologist, and it wasn't even acknowledged as a, a question. Uh, it was just diverted to football. And, you know, that dismissal mm. of that experience yeah. was really heartbreaking. And then I, as a carer had to continue to support and work with him because he has to lead those conversations around mental health support. And, and I wonder if sometimes from a provider side, like, you know, you sort of hear that story from you and you think, how on earth can that happen? And then you think, well, what's the psychology behind that? It must be some sort of discomfort on the healthcare provider side to be able to discuss you know, those weighty issues with a 26-year-old, just almost like a sense of avoidance of, of the issue in a way. I, my observation is medical professionals are fantastic at focusing on keeping you alive. Mm. They need to do better at having conversations that are very hard emotionally around your mental health and also making death not such a difficult topic to talk about either. Yeah. And the more open that we can be about these conversations will completely transform the way that a consumer is going to engage in the hospital system. 
So that's a really nice way to sort of close our interview today, Heidi. It's a really good message for healthcare professionals out there. It's also important, I guess, to reflect that you know, the core of the burden felt by you and Andy is also something that sh- can be shared by health professionals that has effect on them as well. Yeah. Um, and, and, but in acknowledging that, it is something that we have to take on as healthcare professionals. We have to have those conversations. Most importantly, we've got to have time for those con- conversations because not everyone has the same amount of time in, on this world. Hmm. And I had to have those conversations with the most important person to me in the world. Mm. And I had to remove my personal bias from those conversations because I needed to remember that it was all about him. Mm. And sometimes I had to think, are you actually feeling suicidal or are you experiencing the end of your life? So if my advice in, in the situation where I had to have this conversation with the most important person in my life was stepping back and being able to talk to them and hear and listen to what they needed and what they wanted and giving them space to be able to do that Mm. and not agreeing or disagreeing with anything but being a part of supporting them to get to where they wanted to go. Such an incredibly powerful message. You are an incredible patient advocate. You are an incredible partner to Andy and uh, you're a great friend to me. So thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much.